Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Kira, for the warm up that you provided and all the all the tech points that you raised. Um, to all the participants who are joining us from around the world, we would like to wish you a warm welcome to the 2022 annual meeting for the Child Protection in Humanitarian Action. My name is Hani Mansurian, and I'm one of the co-coordinators of the, of the Alliance, seconded by UNICEF. And I apologize for my voice. I'm struggling with a bit of pneumonia. Um, so if I have to cough, I'll, um, I'll mute myself. Um, I'm joined here by my co-coordinator, Camilla Jones, who is seconded from uh, World Vision. And since this is Camilla's first annual meeting with us, I would like to uh, ask everyone to join me in welcoming Camilla to the Alliance. Hello again. We're proud to say that this is the Alliance's seventh annual meeting and our third online annual meeting. Having our meetings online has helped us to reach a much wider range of participants from across continents and sectors. This is fantastic as it will help us to achieve our collective goal of ensuring that children and their protection are at the center of all humanitarian action. To help us learn more about who's joining us today, you can complete a Mentimeter that is gonna be in the chat to tell us where you are located in the world uh, and which sector you mainly work in. You just need to click on the link and enter the code uh, that you can find in the chat box at the moment. Perfect, thanks for filling it up. Camilla, do you want, should we move forward and while wait while people? Sure, uh, why not? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, as you know, today coincides with World Refugee Day. And we wanted to seize this opportunity to celebrate the resilience of millions of refugees around the world. So to mark the occasion, all of today's sessions have been designed to highlight refugee issues and contexts. Um, and we'd like to extend enormous thanks to UNHCR and the many individuals that have worked to bring these events together for this special day. Today also kicks off the meetings focus on Alliance on this Alliance strategy. You will hear from child protection and other sector practitioners, policymakers, advocates and donors, as well as children and young people themselves. You will hear about how their work and their experiences relate to the strategic priorities of the Alliance. As you may remember, um, in 2021 annual meeting, um, together with, you, with many of you, I hope, we launched our 2021-2025 strategy, a clarion call. This year, our annual meeting is an opportunity for us to dig deeper into the operationalization of the different st strategic priorities outlined in our strategy. The focus of this year's meeting will be accountability to children, localization, and multi-sector and integrated programming, which complements the theme of last year's annual meeting, which focused on, uh, on one of our strategic priorities on prevention. So the annual meeting is also an opportunity for you, our community, to reflect on and share ways of incorporating these priorities in your day-to-day -day work. We aim for the annual meeting to be a place for those working with and for children to gather, meet, share and learn. This year, we also want to engage you in thinking about how we put our strategic priorities into action, which will help us move the ambition that's set in our strategy to being the reality for children we serve. This year, we're offering several workshops on the different strategic priorities in practice. You can review the agenda and pick and choose the themes that interest you. To prepare for these, we put, put out a call to our wider community. This includes over 170 members, over 13,000 social media users, and over 1,000 practitioners using our community of practice. We were heartened by the great interest in this event. 72 individuals or agencies applied to speak at this year's meeting. We would like to thank those who volunteered their time and expertise to review and select the abstracts that were submitted, as well as those who submitted abstracts. We invited over half of them to present in our strategic priorities and practice sessions. We would like to extend our enormous gratitude to the team of facilitators from across the Alliance who have been working on developing interactive sessions with the speakers in the build up to the meeting. Others that submitted abstracts were invited to prepare infographics, which you can view if you, if you, if you join our lively community of practice. 
You can also join a presentation with many of the authors of these infographics during the meeting breaks. Please check out the schedule of infographic presentations alongside our full agenda in Philo. So during this meeting, we'll also hear from some of our working group task force and initiative leads about the highly specialized work that they and their colleagues are doing. These groups operate as the technical backstop for the sector and are open for all members to join or engage in. So have a think about how they might be relevant for you. Tomorrow, we will have a session to launch the participatory research study conducted in, in partnership with the Interagency Network for Education and Emergencies on the impact of the COVID-19 crisis, sorry, COVID-19 school closures on child protection and education inequalities in humanitarian settings. This will be held from 4.30 to 6 p.m. Central European time. And on Wednesday, we will have a session where you can hear from donors and tell them about your views on where the gaps are and how they can better support the child protection sector. With thanks to UNHCR's generous contribution, we're providing interpretation across all sessions at this year's meeting, which is fantastic as well as closed caption subtitling in English and live drawing. We hope this will make the meeting accessible to a wide range of participants and uh, be more inclusive. If you're unable to join any of the sessions due to time zones or other reasons, all the sessions will be recorded and available after the event on our Facebook and YouTube channel. We have also had over 1,200 people expressing interest to join this event. So we had about 1,200 people registering. This is one of the positive aspects of having events online as it allows for a wider participation from colleagues around the world. So this would be a few days rich with learning. We hope that you'll be with us engaging in the incredible, incredible range of um, sessions and with the incredible range of speakers from all around the globe. Some of them are working in the most challenging humanitarian contexts and prioritizing their time to be here with us. And we hope that you can stay as much as you can away from your emails and, and really participate. Great. Before um, I go to the last part of our welcome, maybe um, if the producers can project the Mentimeter, just do a little recap on that, and then we close our welcome. Great. So it looks like majority are coming from child protection, but we have quite a number of colleagues from education um, from broader protection, uh, alternative care, refugee child protection advocacy colleagues. Um, it's really great to see the social work, gender and education. It's really great to see um, the wide range of uh, the type of backgrounds that people come with. Julie, is it, or one of the producers, is it possible to go back? Yeah, perfect. Um, so we have a majority from Europe, interesting. And then after that, Africa, and then Asia, and then North America, and Australia and South America come following. Great. Thank you very much to everyone uh, that helped us get, get a sense of where people are coming from. So this session is really um, to, to help you to, to see some really solid programs in action. Um, the kind of programs that can uh, help uh, children to have those positive outcomes. Throughout the session, we wanted to bring the strategy to life. So we've got some examples of different programs from different parts of the world. And we'll be hearing a bit more about these programs from staff of four of our member organizations. Those member organizations uh, are represented uh, in the panel uh, and they demonstrate different kinds of organizations that make up the Alliance from UN agencies, international NGOs, international networks and national organizations. So they'll each start by sharing a little bit about the context of their programming, then we'll move into a question and answer session or panel. So before I introduce our, our eminent speakers, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Elspeth Chapman, our strategic partnerships and advocacy specialist at the Alliance Secretariat. She's going to give us an overview of the strategy, which for some might be a refresher, but either way, it's going to set us up nicely for the, the inputs that follow from our panelists. Over to you, Elspeth. Alexa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Camilla. And hello, everyone. It's lovely to be here and to see, to see you here at the annual meeting. 
So before we go to our speakers, I would just like to take a few minutes to introduce the Alliance's strategy, a clarion call, the centrality to children and their protection within humanitarian action. If um, Julie, you could put the first slide on. Um, some of you will be very familiar with the strategy and for others, it might be new. Uh, but it was developed over the course of a year in 2020 and 2021 with thanks to hundreds of child protection practitioners, Alliance members, supporters uh, who participated in consultations, surveys and shared their insights. So we really believe the strategy reflects the voice of our members uh, and the needs and the priorities of the wider child protection and humanitarian action sector. So we presented it to you at our annual meeting uh, last October, and of course, many of you were also present at our external launch, uh, which was co-hosted by the government of Norway last uh, December. So looking at the bubble at the top, the overarching goal is the centrality of their children and their protection is recognized and prioritized as life-saving and essential across the humanitarian system. So we know that all too often children and their protection are excluded from humanitarian planning and, re and response. This was really clear to us during the COVID-19 response. Uh, and we had a stark reminder again this year when the first flash appeal for the Ukraine response was launched uh, in March with a com almost a complete absence of child protection. So all of our, the Alliance's technical work, our advocacy, our collaboration and partnerships will contribute to this ambitious goal through, act, through action around four strategic priorities, which are all very interlinked, as you will see. So moving to the next slide, you can see the first strategic priority is on accountability and specifically that all humanitarian programs are accountable to children and ensure their meaningful and equitable uh, participation. So we know that true accountability to affected populations requires accountability to children. Um, as is enshrined in the Convention on the Rights of the Child, children have the right to be heard and their views given due weight. Um, as humanitarian actors across different sectors and all levels of the humanitarian system, we really have a duty to, to children to contribute to their protection and ensure their safeguarding. Children should be consulted, engaged, and partnered with through all stages of the humanitarian program cycle. Um, but we know there are major challenges to making this a reality. Um, and in many humanitarian sec uh, sectors and many actors are unsure of how to be accountable to children. I'm sure we've witnessed this in our day-to-day -day work, but this can result in simply not including children for fear of doing harm or doing so inadequately. As you will hear about during this annual meeting, actually, um, some of our colleagues have been working on evidence reviews on linkages between child protection and some key sectors. Um, and I really want to just share with you very quickly that the findings from the Food Security and Child Protection Review really speak to this. It highlights that children have unique experiences of food security and often play a critical and active role in their household's food security, yet they're rarely consulted about it, how it impacts them and how it impacts their protection, and are subsequently often absent from, from subsequent interventions. Therefore, we have a role to play, ensuring that we as a child protection and humanitarian action sector are reaching the highest standards in regards to accountability to ch children, and we can also provide support across the humanitarian system. So moving to the next slide, the second prior, uh, strategic priority is on localization and that the child protection sector transforms its ways of working rooted in the sharing of capacity, expertise, opportunity, and the intentional shift of power and resources to actors. Um, so the key word really in this strategic priority is transform. It really recognizes the need for a process of change that, that should be prioritized in the coming years. So this priority has two parts. The one is the first one is really focused on the alliance, our governance and structures that we increase inclusion and diversity, that we facilitate membership processes and expand opportunities for leadership for influence and for engagements for community, local and national actors across the network spaces. And that we improve the accessibility and diversity of Alliance products, platforms and events to reach broader and more diverse audiences. 
And the second pathway is more external facing and looking to transform the child protection sector's ways of working in culture and practice and ensure that as the child protection and humanitarian action sector, we are really playing our role in contributing to the wider localization agenda. The third priority, so the next slide, thanks, Julie, is around um, multi-sector and integrated programming and collaboration. So ch children's protection and well-being are prioritized within cross-sector collaboration, including within multi-sector and integrated programs and across all humanitarian action. So we know that children's needs, as we heard in the previous session, are holistic. They are multi-sectoral by nature, and no sector alone has all the tools, the resources and knowledge to ensure the well-being and protection of children. Um, so child protection actors have been working for years to strengthen relationships with other sectors. Child, if I know many of you know education and child protection sectors have had a long history of collaboration and, and many of the sessions this week will be testament to that, both between the CPAOR and the Global Education Cluster, as well as between the Alliance and the Interagency Network for Education and Emergencies. The Child Protection Minimum Standards Working Group has an exciting multi-year initiative to promote and operationalize Pillar 4 of the Child Protection Minimum Standards working across sectors and is currently actively building partnerships with camp coordination and camp management, education, health, and in partnership with Plan International and the Child Protection Area of Responsibility with the food security sector. So we look forward to work to working with you all and to supporting and building on these existing partnerships, both new and old, as well as exploring new ones. The fourth strategic priority, so the next slide, is on prevention, and that prevention is understood and prioritized as a critical element of child protection across humanitarian action. As many of you know, are and very active in, the Alliance has been working and leading the way on prevention for several years. There is a growing body of evidence to show that prioritizing preventing harm to children before it happens is a smart and where it is possible an ethical choice. However, in a sector that is overwhelmingly focused on response, for example, reuniting with children with caregivers after separation has occurred, a shift of focus to prevention really requires transformation in the way that we work as child protection actors. We need the tools, the evidence, the capacity, the experience and resources to view our role and the context in which we work through a prevention lens. Prevention programming is also very multi-sectoral by nature, and you will see that all the strategic priorities of the strategy are very much interlinked. The last two things I would like to highlight is that the climate crisis was also identified as an urgent area in which the Alliance could help lead the sector given the strong connections between the strategic priorities and work on climate action and climate justice. And I would also like to highlight, um, finally, that the core function of the Alliance, capacity strengthening, learning and development, has an elevated status for this strategic period. This is in recognition of the important role that capacity strengthening, learning and development will play in, in achieving these uh, strategic objectives, um, and it also builds upon sec um, on evidence from sectoral capacity gaps analysis and responds to requests from, from, our, from our members and across the sector regarding the need for, for leadership and coordination around child protection, learning and development initiatives moving forward. So we will all have the opportunity to dive into the strategy in much more detail over the course of the next three days. And we really look forward to working with and learning from you all as we embark on the next phase of our strategic journey, which as you know, is to develop an operational strategic framework to guide our implementation. So thank you very much. And I would like to hand the floor now back to my colleague, Camilla. Thank you. Fabulous. Thanks so much, Elspeth. That was really, um, really helpful introduction. And I think some people have asked for the slides already to be shared on the chat because they want to go over them in more detail, which is always uh, good to see. So um, I'll try and keep us uh, catch us up with timing. So we finish on time for the session. But um, I will still take a moment to briefly introduce uh, a little bit about our four speakers who are joining our panel today. They're then gonna take uh, a couple of minutes uh, to share a little bit about um, their, their programs and a few opening remarks. 
and then we'll go into uh, a little question, one or two questions with each of them before we wrap up the session. So the first of our speakers today, I'll be joined by Justin Byworth, who I think has just come on the video. He's the Global Humanitarian Director at World Vision. Justin's had a career spanning 30 years in the humanitarian sector um, in the UK, Europe, Africa and Asia. With World Vision, Justin's led teams focusing on programmes and policy, funding and advocacy, including as CEO of World Vision and Director of World Vision's Brussels office. Um, Justin's been in his current role since 2017, uh, where he leads emergency responses to disaster and conflict worldwide. We're also joined by Allah, uh, Raja Mugra Mugrabir, sorry, we would have covered the pronunciation in the tech check, which we weren't able to do today. She's the Child Protection in Emergency Specialist at Hurus Network, an NGO in Syria. Um, Allah is the technical expert at Hurus Network, and she develops technical content for the organization, supports development of research, training, webinars, and um, partnerships with international and national organizations such as ours. She's also developed child protection strategies and supported and supervised technical teams, so a really broad range there. Allah is a pharmacy doctor and is also studying now towards an MSc in international public health. We'll then be joined by Josue Rivera, who's the regional manager for the Protected Passage Programme of Child Fund. Josue has served as consul to Honduras in Los Angeles, California, focusing on the challenges migrants faced once they arrived in the US, including family reunification and deportation. He oversaw migration affairs at the Honduran embassy in Mexico City, particularly the assistance of in-transit migrants. He's also served as international affairs advisor to the Mexican House of Deputies and Mexican Senate during the Trump administration. So he's obviously not shy of uh, tricky assignments. Um, Josue holds postgraduate degrees in international affairs and international cooperation and development. And last but not least, we'll be joined by uh, Yolanda Van Westering, Chief of Child Protection for UNICEF Ethiopia Country Office. Yolanda's worked in child protection with UNICEF for the past 20 years. Yolanda worked as Chief, Ch Chief of Child Protection in UNICEF's offices in Zimbabwe, Namibia and China, where she led a number of programmes integrating child protection with other sector programming. She managed UNICEF's social and child welfare programme in, in Cambodia and undertook assignments in UNICEF's country offices in the Philippines, Pakistan, Bangladesh and Central African Republic and served as UNICEF's emergency operation in uh, UNICEF's emergency operations unit in Geneva. So I think you can all agree that we've got some seasoned professionals um, with a really wonderful wealth of experience uh, with us today. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Justin uh, to share his initial uh, presentation with us. And I believe he's got some slides Thank you. for us to show. So much. I'll uh, I'll get started, and if the slides come up, that's great. But don't worry too much if they don't. Um, yeah, it's fantastic to be with you today. Yeah, I'm remembering that the last time I was uh, with the alliance was actually the launch of the alliance, and it was face to face. So, uh, um, some of the edges were very different back in those days. I think it was was it seven years ago, six years ago, something like that, in Geneva for the launch. It's really exciting uh, for World Vision. You know, uh, we are. The putting children at, um, at the centre of our humanitarian action and putting the protection of children at the centre is just core, so core to who we are as an organisation and to the work that we do. Um, so we're delighted to be, uh, you know, committed members since the launch of the Alliance and, and now stepping um, to help co-chair and co-lead the Alliance through this, through this next period. And what an exciting time it is with the new strategy. Um, putting uh, children, the centrality of children and child protection even for me coming into this session it's going to be great as I step into all kinds of other things I think an ISC deputies meeting in a couple of days time and various other forums um, I was with the WFP board meeting this morning it helps me stepping into this session to, to step into those different places and do that and, and actually um, with you come I mean straight after hearing from from children sadly I wasn't able to be in that last session but that's the most important of all and we'll be speaking about that in just a minute on in terms of accountability to to children and within our work as you know from the session already today of course is world refugee day and uh 
And yeah, World well Vision has done a report the last couple of years. Um, and in fact, we've just, just completed the reports just launched today, uh, a survey of over 300 uh, IDP, internally displaced person and refugee children in 11 households in 11 countries. Um, and uh, one of the standout statistics of that for me was that of those that we, um, that we met, that we heard from, that we interviewed, 44% of refugee and IDP children do not have, said they do not have access to child protection services. And that's a 13% increase from last year. Um, there's lots more besides uh, in, in, on, our, on our report on that, which you might want to take a look at, but shocking, nearly half, you know, 44% of children not having access to child protection. So the centrality of, of um, putting, yeah, here you'll see a little bit of a, some highlights um, of, of our report. Um, but so you'll, you'll see in that um, the reality of this. And I want to share a little bit when we, um, when we come to the Q&A, Camilla's gonna facilitate. Um, I'll share a little bit more about two programs um, where we are trying to live out the strategy. Um, firstly, from uh, Bangladesh, uh, the, Ref the Rohingya refugee programs, um, and where we're gonna look at some of our work around accountability to children, making our accountability systems, which of course we've invested in and committed to for many years, um, and placing not just people at the centre, but children at the centre. We've just been through last year our CHS uh, core humanitarian st standard verification. And so we're really excited to try to take that over um, much more fully into, into child-focused accountability systems. And then I'm gonna speak a little bit about our work uh, in Ukraine, of course of all the crises right now, the one with the head, biggest headlines, um, but also one which is very clearly a child protection crisis in and of itself. Um, so yeah, let me, uh, let me not say too much more now, um, if I can help us catch up with time, or at least not make it worse, um, Camilla, probably you put that, but thank you for the great introduction. Really looking forward to hearing from Ala, from Hoshua, from Yolanda as well. And uh, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll hand over back to you, Camilla. Thanks so much, Justin, and for flagging your report, uh, the report that World Vision's publishing uh, today, I believe. I think it's going to be posted in the chat, unless I'm not mistaken. Um, so I, before, um, yes, without any further ado, I'll hand over to Ala for her initial presentation. Please yeah, great. So um, uh, thank you very much, Camilla, and for all my uh, colleagues today, as we are going to emphasize on um, uh, the centrality of the children and their protection and our works. And um, uh, I'm going to uh, slightly introduce how Hurras Network has um, since the localization of child protection within uh, its work in introducing the safeguarding um, system. Uh, uh, within the schools that we were working with. So um, if we can um, go to the next slide, I can uh, share a little bit of information about Northwest Syria and the context that we were working with uh, and we are working with, uh, sorry. So um, um, the, the issue of uh, child protection has gone beyond the conflict of uh, 10 years now, um, uh, like, before the uh, prior to the conflict, we had a minimal existence of uh, safeguarding um, systems or uh, policies that are uh, working. And uh, this has further uh, raised the challenge for the uh, network to work uh, with, the, with the schools in introducing the system. So, uh, but since our establishment as Harass Network, uh, Network, we committed ourselves to working uh, during the worst stages of conflict. We helped the most vulnerable children, including those with dis disabilities, to access protection and FPSS education to be self well and educated children. Harass uh, Network has integrated a child safeguarding system into 1,400 schools, which has reduced harm over. 300,000 children. And we have established a network of 31 child, uh, local child protection committees or networks, let's uh, call them, in different regions acro across Syria. And this is the essence of uh, what I want to uh, further explain in our questions uh, and in the panel discussion. Uh, Harass also protects children against child recruitment, uh, abuse of labor and exploitation, child marriage, and we work to empowering, empowering communities 
to provide equal opportunities for boys and girls. Um, uh, we understand that local leadership will emphasize the safety and protection of children through awareness raising, building networks and relationships with the communities, and most importantly, standardizing school protection systems, especially in a context such as Northwest Syria, we offic uh, where official authorities are, or policies are lacking. We strive to provide safe school settings by preventing and responding to safety concerns. Our strategy is comprehensive such, uh, and touch based on different uh, locations from the Alliance strategy, but I'm going to explain further how the localization um, uh, has, has affected our success in applying this strategy. I'm uh, aware of the time, so I'm not gonna, um, I'm gonna leave space for the questions and the discussion to explain more and I will hand over to you, Camilla, thank you. Lovely, Ala, I think you set the scene really well there and uh, you've given us a bit of a trailer of what you'll talk about next, uh, both localization and uh, the accountability uh, mechanism in the schools that you, you've set up so broadly across Syria, which is, is very impressive. Okay, so I'll hand over now to Hozue to share about his program. Welcome, Hozue. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me properly? Okay. Yes, thank you. Uh, we also have some slides and I'll go through them very quickly. Uh, so this is our, our program, Protected Passage. It's a multi-organization, multi-country program. Uh, we're here with our colleagues also from Aduco and Plan International and working together, building on each of our strengths and presences. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So this is just to give you an idea of what Protected Passage is, although today we'll be focusing on our intervention in Mexico, but we're also present in Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, and the south part of Mexico. Uh, we're uh, basically assisting all parts of the, of the migration journey, uh, specifically in Central America and Mexico, but more and more seeing people who are coming in from other continents like Asia and, and Africa. Also, uh, we've seen an increase of Venezuelans who are coming into the border, specifically through Honduras, uh, increase of Nicaraguans and, and many other uh, nationalities. Next slide, please. So just to put the situation in numbers very quickly, by April 2022, UNHCR was already reporting that there were already about 40,000 asylum claims. If we compare that to the last year, which was in 2021, they had a total of 130,000. Uh, we see that this is probably gonna be an increase by 2022, and it just shows the, the amount of uh, humanitarian need that there is at these places. Uh, as an assessment done by UNICEF showed that almost 900,000 children in Mexico have humanitarian assistance needs. And this has to do with them being in extreme poverty. Uh, according to UNHCR, only 18% of their financial requirements have been met this by May 5th, which also shows a huge gap in the, the amount of services and the amount of uh, humanitarian aid needed. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, some of the child protection concerns, limited legal assistance. This has a lot to do with uh, people having false information with uh, fraud and risky options. Uh, people believe in that they might uh, be able to cross the border uh, undocumentedly, uh, irregularly, and so on, leading to a many despair of children. At the same time, children continue to deal with abuse, violence, and economic hardship. Of course, we see this through the stress that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis as we interact with children in our, in our daily interventions. Um, we also are showing like how children are not receiving formal education. They have a hard time uh, inserting themselves in the, in the regular system. Uh, this is one of the biggest challenges where you're dealing with people on the move, especially with children and adolescents. And they have few services of psychosocial support and case management is always a huge challenge in this kind of context. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, what are we doing through our program interventions, which I'll go by really quickly. We do health services, which include COVID prevention and treatment. Uh, we also do legal counseling to kind of help uh, use uh, and lose some of that uh, uncertainty to the, the children, might have, not only children, but their parents or their guardians might have, and psychosocial support interventions that meet the needs of children and adolescents. This is one of the biggest challenges, one of the big transfers of, of knowledge that we're doing. We do this as a way to use these activities to uh, be able to see where the, the risk might be for children to identify cases of abuse or where children might be at risk and be able to refer them and take on those cases properly. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, local ship and partnership. So here we do basically two types of interventions. We work within shelters, uh, shelters where uh, we have migrants who are, who are waiting for their documents. In many cases, uh, 
uh, UNHCR is helping out with actually getting those documents processed through the proper channels within Mexico. But at the same time, one of the things that we're doing that highlights also our localization is uh, going to this uh, houses, uh, temporary housing, or uh, different communities that might be around uh, the, the main cities where, where migrants are, are selling and just taking services to them. These are people who are like with a lot of, um, they have a lot of lack of services and we're actually getting to them to be able to connect them and to also at the same time connect them to information, which is key in this context. Uh, misinformation is one of the major causes of risk, not only for, for children, but also for their parents. And we're trying to address this by connecting uh, these unserved populations. Uh, next, please. And these are some of the results. Very quickly, uh, this uh, ha have been updated. We weren't able to get the slide up there, but we're almost at 18,000 people. This is a uh, five uh, month intervention so far. And these are some of the results that we're getting. Uh, we keep on seeing uh, about 50% of them are still men, 48% uh, uh, of them women. Uh, we have about 26% of the people that, of the uh, who are we are assisting who are children. And uh, we are still seeing because of the, of the context at this moment, uh, most of the population being from Haiti, from Honduras, other, other countries other countries within Central America, and an increase in Nicaraguans and Venezuelans, but at the same time also uh, people from, from Africa, from different countries there, and uh, continuity from Asia. Um, at this moment, our population that we have reached is around 18,000 by the last count that we had, which was done about uh, two weeks ago, and we can continue to have people on the ground who are taking in this, uh, all this information and co constantly assisting people on the ground. So. This just to give a brief uh, overview of this. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Azue. We'll hand over to Yolanda and then we'll come back to you shortly for some further information on the context and the program. Lovely. Thank you very much, Camilla. Uh, really good morning to everyone uh, and good afternoon uh, where I am. Really delighted to be with you all to give a bit of an update on, um, on how we're doing in Ethiopia in, in, in our humanitarian context. Um, and I'll be speaking in the Q&A about some of the models that we are implementing here in Ethiopia um, that are relating to multi-sectoral integrated programming to continue to deliver child protection services. So briefly um, on Ethiopia, Ethiopia is a country that is traditionally, we can go to the next slide, Camilla. Yeah, Ethiopia is, is prone traditionally to a range of humanitarian crises. Uh, conflicts, political insurgency, uh, inter-ethnic conflict, but also increasingly uh, humanitarian uh, and uh, climate-related shocks such as flood and, and, and drought. Um, at the moment, um, the region that is mostly to the north, Tigray, um, since November 2020 has been in war with the federal authorities and that conflict has last year uh, trickled down um, almost uh, close to Addis Ababa, um, covering also uh, Amara and Afar. So basically your whole north of the country has been affected by conflict. Then the southeast of the country has been affected by one of the worst droughts in um, the Horn of Africa. So uh, coupled with political insurgency in other regions, uh, the country is really in full-blown humanitarian crisis. And that has led to quite significant numbers of IDPs and refugees. So last year, we've seen more than 5 million refugees. And still today, 4.5 million individuals uh, in Ethiopia are uh, internally displaced. If we go to the next slide, we can see that um, Ethiopia is also host to one of the um, largest refugee populations in Africa mostly in the regions that are bordering uh, Somalia and that are bordering South Sudan. We see large uh, refugee populations. And at the moment, there's almost um, 680,000 um, refugees and asylum seekers, seekers in the country. And the majority of them are children. Uh, and as we see elsewhere, um, refugees and IDPs are hosted in areas where local authorities are already weak um, social services are strained and infrastructure is very limited. So this causes some tensions um, to, uh, to the existing services. We can go to the next slide. Um, Ethiopia's multiple crises have led um, to quite a shocking number of 26 million people in Ethiopia being the quarter of the population uh, being reliant 
on humanitarian aid. Uh, and this is the population that the humanitarian um, community in Ethiopia is responding to. 53% of that population is a child. And if we can go to the next slide, the last slide of this context, um, of course, there are major protection concerns with any other in any humanitarian crisis and also in Ethiopia, the protection concerns are enormous. We see a, a range of family separation, unaccompanied and separated children in almost every region um, and in Tigray, the northern region alone, 8000 children have been um, separated or unaccompanied from their caregivers. We see a host of mental health and psychosocial support needs across the conflict and drought affected areas. Gender based violence has gone up. We are increasingly getting data of sharply increased gender based violence, some of it conflict related um, and much of it underreported. Um, harmful practices is uh, a protection risk that is going up as well in Ethiopia. Ethiopia is um, um, has been doing really well in addressing early marriage, FGM in the past, uh, I would say up to two years ago, but unfortunately we are seeing a sharp rise in especially the drought affected regions of the country. In some regions we see a 200% increase of early marriage, um, so a lot of the gains are being negated. Uh, huge numbers of out of school children um, because of uh, conflict and drought um, and of course poverty, poverty. but humanitarian uh, crises alone are um, leading to no less than 3.7 million children in Ethiopia being out of school. Child labor and exploitation is going up um, and the already weak child protection system is really being strained. So in the Q&A, Camilla, uh, before I hand over to you, I'll be speaking to two models of integrated programming that we are uh, implementing in, uh, in Ethiopia. So over to you. Lovely, thank you. So we've now had a chance for everybody to set the scene and let us know a little bit about the nature of the context where their uh, programs are and a little bit about how they link to our strategic priorities. So I'm now gonna delve a little bit deeper with each one of them so you can see how the program works and, and the linkages to the strategy a bit more strongly. So um, first we'll move to Justin. Justin, um, you referenced our strategic priority on accountability in your intervention when you mentioned your programs in Bangladesh. I was wondering if you could briefly illustrate how your program works for the participants. Of course. Well, thank you. And uh, so, yes, uh, probably many of you know, um, in the south of Bangladesh, uh, the, one of the biggest refugee camps in the world with Rohingya refugees from Myanmar. Um, we've been working there for many years. Um, and uh, in fact, my team, I took our leadership team of our humanitarian team in World Vision to, to there a couple of years ago. And we spent, um, we spent a whole week having our team meeting there, but we spent a whole day with our accountability expert in the camps um, there and actually saying, looking at how is accountability working and making sure that that accountability system could start to work for children. Um, again, I, I referred earlier to the core humanitarian standard, you know, where we have the nine accountability commitments, nine commitments, including accountability, but it's about putting children at the center of that. Um, and we want to take our accountability systems that we have in place we designed and, and resourced for many years in places like um, Cox's Bazaar, the, the camps there, and actually turn it into a accountability system that can work for children. So let me give some examples of, of how that's going. We have challenges still, um, but we've also had some some really good um, some really good learnings and, and some good examples of that. Um, so of course the base of that is establishing groups, um, establishing children's ability to participate in. Um, in, in the accountability mechanisms, but in the programming mm. activities and to make sure we're hearing their voices as we just heard um, earlier today in, in the session. Um, one of the things we heard was that storytelling was perhaps the most effective way um, for many children for, um, for things to be communicated, uh, for things around behavior, for things around um, uh, programming, for the, uh, th you know, every, raising awareness on child protection issues, on education issues. And so actually storytelling has now become the default mechanism, the default way of working in many of our program areas that we use 
um, well, your stories. And uh, you'll see that in the in the early childhood development centers there, you'll see uh, books that have things in there. They're all story based books. Um, uh, we also have very cool things around security and safety in some of the areas that we work. For example, um, uh, playgrounds there. And uh, in fact, I remember when I was there myself last time, there was issues of lighting uh, that children had spoken of. Bits of the of the camps that were well well lit, um, which at night time uh, and dark was was when security and safety risks were at the worst. And we heard that from children. Um, and we heard particular risks around some some of the the playground areas. And again working taking those children's um input and engaging with camp management um staff and also the the local government who who oversee camp management the whole we've managed to address those risks um i think all of these examples are about embedding a culture um where children are they they are part of the decision making they are part of the communication um and uh, and of course you know, as I mentioned, different children's groups. We've got peer groups, we've got adolescent groups um, for different for different uh, type of activities and things. But one of the challenges we face still is some of the cultural and and, and social norms there, um, particularly around the inclusion of girls um, around uh, the gender perspective of this. So, uh, one of the things we're doing is working with faith leaders. Uh, working with parenting, we've got some some work that we do with parenting groups um, there to try and address um, some of those cultural social norms on, on the participation of girls. And again, we're seeing uh, we're seeing changes in that where girls' voice and girls' views are being more actively taken into account. There's lots more I could say, but probably that's that's enough for now. Well, I mean, it's very interesting to see that you've taken the tangible feedback from children to improve their safety. You've also communicated to them in a way that works for them and you've consulted them on what that looks like, but also looking at how to reduce barriers from their to their participation by, you know, thinking about social norms and, and who can kind of make that change. That's really interesting. I know we're a little short on time, but I'd love to hear just a little bit about your Ukraine crisis response, your emerging response, should I say, and how it's connecting with the alliance strategy. So that'd be great. Well, I mean, obviously, Ukraine has been, I'm sure for many of our agencies, has been keeping us busy um, since uh, we were not working there before, since bef before February the 24th. Um, and so one, uh, there's two areas, I guess, I call out of strategy where our Ukraine response has been really on the strategy for the Alliance strategy. One is localization, and secondly is integration integrated I mean, areas for two of those objectives that um, Elspeth so, so communicated so well earlier. Um, Maybe I'll just speak a little bit very briefly about the integration one first and then a little bit on, on the localization. On integration, um, you mentioned actually, I think, Camilla, maybe it was you who mentioned that education or Elspeth mentioned education is one area, but also mental health and psychosocial support is absolutely one of the biggest needs um, in the response for Ukraine for obvious reasons. Um, the kind of um, the kind of challenges, as well as the physical dangers and injuries in uh, from from the war itself, um, the mental health and psychosocial distress um, of what children have have been through and are coping with, um, those that have stayed, those that are moving as internally displaced or refugees, um, and we've seen many gaps um, in the referral pathways, for example, on, on services, as so much of the population has been there. So. What we've really done is make sure that our MHPSS, our mental health and psychosocial work, is from the beginning is not siloed with our protection work. Similarly, um, we've worked whether that's mobile teams, whether that's uh, support, family focused support centres, we've got halfway houses, we're working with a whole range of activities um, that we're also trying to make sure that continuity of learning. The Ukrainian government, as I'm sure some of you know, actually has um, a very effective online virtual learning program that they've they've managed to, to get up and, and going and, and, and through this conflict. But we're finding that, uh, you know, there is also barriers to inclusion for some children there where they're displaced. And there's also things that need to supplement that um, with physical face-to-face uh, -face learning and things. So we're actually about to embark mm. on some summer camps um, in, in the, yeah, through the summer where we bring children face-to-face -to -face together. But we really want to make sure that education mental health um, and, and those things are integrated. And then just, just to say, just a very brief word, that 
our whole program is largely with partners and we're working with such a range of partners recognizing the inherent capacities and, and knowledge that so many of them have many of which are higher than partners in some in some places digital skills for example but also we're working um, with places where there are these gaps in the referral services so we really need to make sure we can plug the gaps and walk alongside the partners and build capacity in the long, in the longer term recognizing we're not likely to stay there as an agency for the very long term we're likely to be there for the next couple of years but we really want to make sure we're, um, uh, we're, we're leaving behind partners that are better equipped. Um, so yeah, localization too. Fantastic. So clearly putting two of our strategic priorities front and center in that emerging Ukraine response. And it will be really interesting to see how that plays out for you and, and uh, what added value it has when we're a year or two into the response. Okay, so handing over to Ala. Um, you mentioned uh, clearly front and center our strategic priority on accountability, but you also dropped in at the end a little bit about localization. So I was wondering if you could describe any challenges you might have faced in incorporating accountability in your programs and how you think the Alliance can support you and others who are trying to incorporate elements of community based approaches in their programs. So that's your, your two questions in one there, Ella. Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, thank you, Camilla, for this uh, question. Well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we were we are working in northwest Syria, where we are out of uh, regime-controlled areas, and we lack uh, of support of uh, former all um, uh, policies that can support our work in uh, establishment and in placing a safeguarding uh, system in schools. So. We faced a lot of challenges, but um, I'm, hap I'm happy to say that we have either um, worked through those challenges and uh, with the community participation, we overcome them or uh, we are an, on the way uh, of, uh, of handing over this um, system to be um, uh, community owned uh, uh, and to be sustainable for uh, later on work. So um, I'm gonna focus more on our community participation because it was the critical to our uh, critical step to the success of the safeguarding program. Uh, we assist communities in developing and implementing high quality safeguarding initiatives. Uh, our role is simply to provide them with the resources and training uh, they need to protect children outside the classroom. Uh, and the children's rights are um, related, related, related protection and child protection issues uh, like, uh, let's say, gender-based discrimination uh, that we, we saw in, in um, uh, girls' participation in their education are raised in regular group, group sessions and uh, with caregivers and the different community members that are influential uh, in their communities. These seminars help uh, members of the communities recognize and reject harmful conduct. However, to, sa to safeguard the most vulnerable children, more focused and extensive efforts are fre frequently required, which uh, was our uh, step in uh, process. Uh, but both at home and at school, violence occurs, we know that, and our protection procedures are ineffective if they are only functional during school hours. So to protect the children, it's vital to maintain cohesive interaction between community and school-based safeguarding program. So we wanted to create this um, uh, environment where we we are not only working with teachers or the head teachers, but we are we are making a holistic approach of uh, working with parents and children uh, themselves. We uh, were communicating those safeguarding uh, procedures in a friend a child friendly language, and we uh, facilitated the participation of children uh, within within their own resilience. And uh, later on, we engaged their parents, so um, it will be more protective and more effective. Uh, and later on, we uh, worked with the community to uh, implement the safeguarding procedure, uh, working, uh, of, of course, with the education directorate, which is the most formal body, let's say, uh, uh, that available in this uh, area uh, or region in, in Syria. 
So all of those um, uh, procedures um, are seen later on. We see that the education directorate has uh, took on this principle and uh, working uh, uh, directly with schools and implementing this uh, uh, system uh, within its uh, elements. So uh, we see that there are new positions uh, opening in schools such as safeguarding or protection officers. Um, those who uh, overlook the system and uh, communicate daily basis with children to see if there is any issues. Then those safeguarding um, officers and uh, the local protection committees I earlier uh, mentioned uh, meet on regular basis to bridge the gap between the lives of children at home and at school. Both parties share information and lessons learned working together to establish school and community safe programs. A good working connection between these two parties ensures that children enrolled in the program are looked after the, uh, after the school. So at last, working with those domains to increase child resilience and moving towards community resilience helped harass network to support community ownership. The same community that refuses refused those principles at the beginning now is working if, um, continuously to, um, to uh, protect their children better and uh, with the community leaders uh, co coordination and influencers and actors to provide children with their basic needs and facilitate early recovery for the communities in Northwest Syria. Fantastic. Well, it sounds like challenging work. It sounds like work you've been consistently doing for some time, starting in the school, moving to the community to try and make the system holistic. Exactly. I'm sure there's uh, lots of linkages there for our school closure session that we've got at the end of the day tomorrow, where we'll be looking at the research from a number of countries on the impact of the school closures and thinking about, you know, really what that means for, for, mm -hmm. for some of the things you've mentioned. And I think uh, Yolanda's going to bring in as well in her session. And also Justin was referencing in, in the way he's starting out with the integrated work with schools and MHPSS in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm conscious of time. I'm, I'm sorry, so sorry to rush some of you a bit today. Um, Hazue, I'd like you to come in now, please. Um, you talked about localization towards the end of your presentation. Could you describe any challenges you faced in incorporating localization? And perhaps if, if there's time, we'll try and keep you to just uh, maximum four or five minutes. Uh, how you think the Alliance can support others who are trying to do the same. So yeah, any challenges and, and how you think others could learn from them? Yes, of course, thank you. So, so there's certainly many challenges working on this context. I think Justin could relate uh, both on localization and then multi-sector integrated programming. That's definitely at the heart of our interventions. And one of the main challenges working on this kind of context is definitely the fact that the influx of migrants in this case, or refugee seekers within in this case, Mexico, uh, tend to make organizations overlook the importance of child protection issues because there are so many other um, services that need to be put in place like food, sheltering, and so on. Uh, and, and we believe that child protection services should be at the center. They should be considered an essential part of the, of the services that are being done. So that's definitely one of them. Another one that we believe and that we've learned uh, from, from our interventions is that we need to overcome this assumption that localization is simply funneling the uh, funds uh, through the organizations. There needs to be a more complex approach to this. Uh, we believe that what we've done through creating a hybrid model where we're also accompanying and, and we have uh, our staff working together with the organizations, learning from each other, learning our, from the organizations, from the context and the strength that they already have, uh, not only in knowledge, but also in the experience uh, of the situation. Uh, helps uh, as we also integrate the different services and child protection expertise that we have coming together to become integrated and becoming a whole. At this time, we're leaving this, uh, when we do uh, decide to, to leave, then we're leaving this organization strengthening their cap capabilities and taking child protection issues as an important part of the programming and the interventions that they might do in the future. As you know, in this case, in the context that we work, this has been the longest uh, migration corridor so this is not something that we're expecting that it's gonna end anytime soon, but we believe but by leaving this, we're leaving a stronger, strength, strength, stronger capabilities, my, my apologies, uh, of, of them. And we do it by on the job training that we do day by day, working together with them, learning more and more. And, and there's a huge pile of knowledge that we have gathered now and that we're 
more than uh, um, excited to share about this. Um, another thing that we need to do is to recognize that child protection issues need to be recognized and promoted on the ground. Uh, th this cannot only be done through training and through uh, doing what we have done uh, uh, traditionally. We need to have new approaches to, th to this type of support. Uh, another thing with just multi-sector and integrated programming and collaboration is con constant context analysis. You cannot uh, think that you're going to design a program, put it in place, and the context is gonna stay the same. This uh, is constantly changing, especially in, in the issues that we are dealing with. So you need to do a constant analysis. One of the great things to, about doing this is to stay in constant communication with the, with the actors who are already on the ground. One of our main uh, partners within the ground here is UNHCR. So we're constantly uh, sharing information with them, sharing information with IOM, sharing information with the other uh, partner organizations that we have here, with local partners, and then seeing where the gaps really are. And where the gaps are, that's where we're tending to, to go. That's what ha has been the heart of our strategy, filling those mm -hmm. existing gaps, continuing to do this, continuing to work, continue to share information and to share knowledge. And this not only keeps us safe, it helps us have a better integration, it helps us have better results. And it, in the end, it helps providing better service, especially for children protection. So, so we believe that this is an approach that it, there's a lot to learn from it. That we believe that it's a constant time for for being given this knowledge and sharing with the rest and just mm -hmm. constantly be open to feedback. Yeah, and I think all of that is linking without you saying it to our accountability priority, which is wonderful. Yes. All right, well, I could happily say more about it, but I'm gonna, in the interest of time, I'm gonna hand over to Yolanda for our final, and I'm sure inspiring uh, sharing. Um, so Yolanda, you talked uh, particularly about our strategic priority three on multi-sector and integrated programming. Um, and I was wondering if you can describe any examples of this programming for child protection outcomes in Ethiopia. And of course, challenges uh, being shared is, is always welcome and something we're encouraging in this year's annual meeting. Absolutely, thank you very much, Camilla. Um, I want to talk about two early models that we're implementing in, in Ethiopia. One is regarding the integrated, integrated approach between education and child protection. And another one is what we call cash plus or cash and care. So briefly about the first intervention, we are in a specific locations that are where education systems have broken down. We are trialing an approach uh, with NGO partners, uh, World Vision, Plan International, and Save the Children, many of them I'm sure are connected today, um, where we offer a safe space where children not only access accelerated learning, but where they also access psychosocial support and referral to other specialized services um, through a case management approach. Uh, we call that approach BETE, which means my home in Amharic. Uh, it's an approach that UNICEF uh, with partners has first tried in the Middle East, and we are now applying this to, uh, to Ethiopia. Um, so a second approach I wanted to briefly talk about, talk about uh, considering the time is Cash Plus. Um, or cash and care, as we also call it. In areas where we are um, implementing humanitarian cash transfers, we are leveraging the cash transfers um, uh, to IDP and host communities to add a protection element. Um, and we are targeting for that protection element, particularly vulnerable households that are vulnerable to protection risks. So one such model, because we have different models in different um, um, locations, is uh, what we implement in Amara, in conflict-affected uh, IDP uh, and, and host community locations, where we are targeting among the IDP households that are uh, receiving the cash transfer, we are targeting um, child-headed households, households that are caring for an orphan or a separated or unaccompanied child, with additional um, services provided through a social work intervention. So these households are, um, are accessed, they are visited by a social worker and the social worker draws up a case plan with them and through a case management approach that is quite nascent in the country still, um, these households are connected to a range of services that they may particularly need. That may be psychosocial support, it may be additional food aid, uh, family tracing or reunification services, um, accelerated learning, so a range of services really. 
Um, so as an example in numbers in Amara so far, and this has started end of last year, among the 60,000 people that were uh, targeted uh, by a humanitarian cash transfer, IDP households and host community households, uh, over a thousand children in these particularly vulnerable households have been reached by a social work intervention, a child protection case management uh, uh, approach through which they've received additional services. And this figure is going up quite rapidly. I believe this month we stand already at 4,000. So that is one cash plus approach that we are trialing. Uh, a second one, very briefly, Camilla, is one that we call um, cash for kids. Now, many of our organizations, I'm sure, are providing uh, digging tickets to um, vulnerable households in humanitarian crises, and so does UNICEF. But what we found in Ethiopia is that um, many times it's either very cost inefficient to provide dignity kits, um, and dignity kits, I should say, uh, contain sanitary pads, uh, items for personal hygiene management, etc. Sometimes um, logistically it's not possible to provide kits, and we've heard in some locations in, in Ethiopia that actually the women and the girls don't necessarily like always the, the type or the size of the items that are being provided. Um, it's quite a one fit for all uh, approach. So what we've started to do in uh, certain conflict uh, affected areas, uh, and again, it's an example from Amara where we've just started this, is um, again, leveraging the humanitarian cash transfer program in IDP settings. We, through social workers, are targeting uh, households with young women and adolescent girls uh, who would usually receive dignity kits with a cash uh, top up, which is to the equivalent of a kit on the local market. Um, and the beauty of it is that um, we are not only providing the cash, but that's the entry point for a social work intervention. So apart from the kit and also apart from the cash, and the cash comes with uh, an awareness raising on how you could, you know, how you could utilize the funds, what the funds are for, this additional top up, but also a protection prevention message and where a woman or a, or a girl can go for help uh, should he or she be um, uh, subject to, uh, to, to violence. So it's, it's, a, it's a first connection to a social worker. And again, in this program, and I, I should say it's very nascent still, we are uh, making a connection with other types of services that the girl or the woman would need. Um, psychosocial support, another type of intervention. Um, so yeah, so far with this particular program, 14,000 um, girls and young women have been reached through social work. So it's one of the examples of where we are maximizing the funds, uh, the cash that we are giving in a humanitarian context by an adding a, a protection component. You asked about challenges uh, very briefly for, for um, the integrated education and child protection intervention. Uh, what we are seeing as two main challenges is um, alignment of partner capacity. There's very limited numbers of organizations um, that are both very specialized in education and very specialized in child protection. So that still is a bit of a challenge in Ethiopia. Uh, and secondly, I think fundraising wise, um, donors are still quite siloed. So it is not necessarily a donor who is interested in child protection may not necessarily be interested in supporting um, um, an education intervention. So that's something we're, we're dealing with. For cash plus programming, um, as elsewhere, uh, Ethiopia is a country where the community social worker workforce is very limited. It's very um, rudimentary. So it's difficult to make social workers available everywhere where we want to. And it's still very much there for UNICEF cash uh, funded. Um, the case management approach is very new in Ethiopia. Um, it's fairly new, the concept that a social worker is not only an administrator, but is also somebody who's actively providing counseling and referral services. Uh, and thirdly, particularly in Ethiopia, we have quite limited a number of civil society organizations. This um, has to do with the polit particular political situation in Ethiopia. Um, so it makes it a little bit difficult to offer specialized services 
everywhere we want uh, in, in hard to reach areas. Thank you, Yolanda. But, uh, they're certainly two, yeah, two promising examples of things. Yes, yes. Well, I, I think it sounds like you're doing some very comprehensive services there and it's really interesting to see how the cash plus intervention works and um, a lot of linkages again with some of the contributions of the other speakers. So I can see them nodding along as you speak and I'm sure the participants would uh, love to have you all on the line for a lot longer to be able to ask uh, more questions. Um, if any of you had the time, you could hop into our Wheelo Coffee Lounge uh, rooms to see if uh, someone pops in there to have a chat with you afterwards. I'm sure they'd be delighted. Otherwise, we do have some other sessions coming up at four o'clock, uh, last two sessions of the day. Um, again, focusing on refugee issues, one on localization, one on integrated programming, education, I believe. Um, they're starting at 4 p.m. CEST, so just on the hour. And we also have some brief 10 minute infographic sessions happening uh, on separate Zoom links that you can access through the Philo. Uh, but before we lose you all uh, to those, I'll say um, a very big thank you to Justin, Ala, Josue and Yolanda for the time they've taken to join us today. Um, it's been really interesting to hear about the nuances of your programs and for you to share openly about challenges you've, you've faced. It's really healthy to, to hear that and good for our accountability. Um, and I think it's also set the stage really well for the remainder of our meeting, where we'll be showcasing such a range of programs, projects, initiatives, um, all on the themes of our strategic, uh, sort of our strategy. So yes, um, over, over to the next sessions and, and thank you to everybody for bearing with us at the beginning with our like little technical delays, some um, teething problems, I think. <laughs> All right, thanks very much then, goodbye.